I think the thing that I enjoy about this group more than anything else is it reflects a little bit of heaven, doesn't it? Um, about years ago, back in the late 60s, I went to New York City and I worked in, I worked in the inner city. And I lived in a predominantly black and Puerto Rican neighborhood. And it was me and one other guy that lived there, and they thought we were police. Uh, and back then, you were so young, you didn't know each other. And uh, you thought, look, I can't do it, I can outrun it. But I, I, I went to New York City thinking I was going to help some people out. But what really happened was they helped me out. And the people that I learned from, I mean, I got some of the best Southern cooking in the Bronx where I was living, where they made the movie for the uh, And I made some really good friendships, and it, it blessed me. So when I come here on Sunday night, it's like being back in New York City. You know? And it's like a little taste of heaven for me and the people that we're going to be with to spend the rest of eternity with. And I thank God for that. The other thing, you know, God, God's made this possible tonight. I mean, every one of us here tonight, God has brought us here, J.C., to, to, to be together as, as a, the body of Christ. A few years ago, Amanda and I began to ride around the roads of Rockdale County on Sunday night just to see if any church had their lights on. And there are not many churches that, that have service on Sunday night. But we were to the point where we had been going from where we live all the way to Decatur to go to church. And I kept thinking, I'm sure I'm passing up a lot of people that I don't know. We get to that church way over there. That's still my church. I'll still be there for a while. But I said, I really need to get to know the people in my neighborhood. I need to get to know the people on my block. So we wound up... Uh, I put this up here before. Uh, we, we wound up going to a variety of places. Now, we found a Hispanic church down the road here that was open on uh, Sunday night. And I pulled up and I said, uh, you do services in English? He said, no. <laughs> and I said, told the man, I said, we're going anyway. So we went there and we sat in the back. The pastor, I had known him from the past. He said, come on up. I, I got someone that, that can interpret for you. So they put a lady in the us and she interpreted the service. It was great. I mean, there, there was such a powerful prayer time before they got started. I mean, anybody could have preached mm -hmm. once those folks got to, got to pray. Yeah. And then he preached on the prodigal son. And, um, but I just enjoyed it. I, I could just soak up the spirit of the people that were there. When we left, they served tacos in the back. That was nice. Uh, but um, I just enjoyed being with the, the, the people of God. And if there was a service going on somewhere, I mean, I've, I've, gone, to, I've gone to every um, campground around here for the, the Methodist campground. I've gone to Presbyterian. I've gone to Shingle Road down to McDonald's. <coughs> just to sit in and just to see what's happening in the church. Because I believe that we're living in such momentous times, special times, important times as believers, that we need to know who each other is, who, what's going on in each other's lives. And I, tonight, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to talk about the, the, the ministry that we call Fellowship of Believers. Because that one word, fellowship, stands out to me more than anything else. What fellowship means. What does it mean to, to have fellowship together? Because it's critical. It's critical that we know who each other is. If I got my work done Monday through Sunday, Monday through Saturday, I got my work done, and in the evening I'd clean it up, and there was a service going on somewhere, I'd be there. I'm, I'm not just any service, but where people were serious about fellowship and being together. I just mean that. That's just the best use of my time. I mean, y'all still watch TV? Yes. I mean, what's good on the side of the weather in the blue chat? Not much. Not much. I mean, it's a waste of time. A better use of my time getting to know the people of God in the community where I live. And I love getting to know them on every level and, and where they are. Because the body of Christ is made up of a lot of folks. And we come from a lot of different backgrounds. We come from, you know, from a lot of different struggles uh, in our life. But many of us don't know each other's story. If we took time to sit down and to give a person a chance to Tell me your story.
talk about that in just a few minutes. It would give us a different opinion and a feeling <laughs> and a sense of relationship that um, that we don't have here tonight. We come in, I recognize this place, I recognize that place, I, you know, I hear this name, I kind of recognize. But some folks say you don't really know me. You really don't know me. Now, there's one person who is given a definition of fellowship, and it just says it's just two guys in a boat. Two fellows in a boat. <laughs> having fellowship, right? Two, two, two fellows in a boat. And um, fellowship, you know, if you define it, it's just people really, in some cases, sharing a moment together. It could be a sunset, it could be a meal, it could be a conversation. It could be laboring together, that could be fellowship. God said of Adam and Eve, I said of Adam, it's not good for man to, you know, to live alone. He needs a companion. We need companionship. There's a lot of folks think, well, I can go to the woods and serve God. Or I can go sit and drink coffee and I can have time with God. But there's something that will never be accomplished in your life itself in community. You being with other people and sharing your life together. JP says, you know, iron sharpening iron many times. Because it's not easy in the church many times for us to dwell and be in the same room, especially thinking about being in the same boat together. I mean, if you want difficulty, just move in with your relatives. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's difficult when we're, when we're brought in, in close proximity to each other, but that's where God does a work in our hearts and in the church. If you're changing churches every six months to a year, you, you've got a problem. <clears throat> Because churches are not perfect. They're not, they're, they are not museums where we go to see special pieces of Christians who are, who are put up there for display. Because we're not perfect. We're people. We're humans. You know. So, but God, God Himself wanted fellowship. That's why He created us, that He could have fellowship. If you really look at the Godhead, the Father loved the Son. The Son loved the Holy Spirit. There's a relationship between, between the Trinity that has existed for all eternity. They love one another. They respect one another. They care for each other. They're very sensitive to how the other is treated. But then He's made us the object of His love. And God wants a special relationship with us. And I believe deep down in my heart that God has put a cry in each one of us to know God. Yes. Know the God who created this world and what His plan is for our life. If we don't care, then, you know, you can be an atheist or you can be a wanderer in the earth. And that's bad, not knowing what your purpose and what the plan is for our life. We're going to find our significance in God Himself. What about the levels of friendship? Now, when you walk in here, there, there's a level of relationship we, by facial recognition, you know, and we may uh, recognize that person. It may, it may be name recognition. There could be a fellowship of, of belief. That's why you've got different denominations. You've got Methodists and Baptists and uh, Southern Buddhists, uh, people like me, you know, uh, like the young bitches, like the guitar and Pentecostals. But we, we have fellowship around certain doctrinal issues. But what I like about Sheldon, Sheldon said he believed in the, in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the blood that he shed for, for us. Believe in the truth. We can go a long way to get we don't have, it, it's not a deal breaker if uh, you want to sprinkle or if you want to dump or, or whatever. It's not a deal breaker for me. If you want to wash feet, you know, which is all part of one church's belief. That's okay with me, but we can go a long way together if we love Jesus, if we love the Lord. Uh, there's other levels of fellowship. Laborers together. This past week, I've been working over there in the mother's house. A bunch of ladies over there. I tell you, if you want to get a job done, you either need 12 good men or six good ladies. <laughs> we, had, we had some women over there. I mean, they, they, they were hard workers. And I thought, man, they pick it up quick. And once they know what to do, you just turn them loose and, and they get it done. But when working together and laboring together, we were, we were fellowship together. We had fun. We were kidding each other and, and just. Um, just having fun. But it was, it was a level of fellowship because we were laboring together. Paul said in the scripture, he said that I might know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his 
suffered. When Jesus spoke to Paul, he said, this man right here, he's been set aside because he's going to suffer a lot for me. It makes chills run down my back to think about having that as your, as, as how you, you're going to be seen in your ministry, that you are going to suffer for the Lord. And he did. He did. He suffered beyond any uh, person in, in the Bible that, that we know about. So there's a fellowship of suffering. Uh, there's a community, the Holocaust survivors, but there's a special identity of those who still live in there and pull that sleeve up and they show that tattoo. They suffered beyond what you and I can even comprehend. And they come together. These veterans, the uh, what they call them, the band of brothers. When you served in, in the armed forces of each other, you have a, a level of respect and a, and a level of knowing that nobody else can identify with. I wasn't in the, I wasn't in the military, so I, I can't step into that community. But when those brothers come together at, at the VA or in the VFW or whatever, they have a, a relationship because they have served together as a fellowship there. So God has brought this group together here tonight. Fellowship of believers. We need to ask ourselves, how significant is that and what does that, what does that mean to us? There is a deeper intimacy, though, that, that that we enter into that is very significant. And it's the marriage relationship. There's an intimacy between a man and a woman that's, that's sacred, it's precious, it's special, and it's not meant to be violated. And when it is violated, it's one of the worst things that can happen. The Bible says God hates divorce. But He also hates the things that comes in between married partners divide them because they have a level of fellowship and relationship that is that is this is, is emblematic of the relationship that we have with God Himself. And the Bible says God hates divorce because Israel has departed from him numerous times in the Old Testament. And he feels what a, a divorced person feels. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes as well. Well, the Bible says in, in Genesis, it says that Adam knew his wife. And the word for knew uh, or know is what? It's Yah. Right? Well, I think so. You help me out now. You're my, my Hebrew scholars here. <laughs> Whatever. You have, you have to remember, was it, was it, what's his name, Seinfeld? Yeah. The comedian. Something to be said about sexual intimacy to Yah, Yah, Yah. But, but all throughout the, the scripture works about knowing that word God is, is an important word. God, whether I'm correct on this or not, I just want you to understand that there's an intimacy that God wants with us. It's not sexual, but it is, a, it is an emotional, spiritual relationship that God wants to have with each one of us. Now there's people here tonight, like as we say, it is. It is? All right? It's Yada. Yada. I just pronounced it. Yada. 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 But it has to do with intimacy and it's used in a broad sense all the way from sexual relationships to knowing information about an, an individual. To know this or to know that. But it, it, it's personal. And God wants to know you. And I believe in my heart that you desire to know God. You desire to know God. How do you how do you get to really know a person? There's two ways. I heard this this past week and I thought it was important. I want to share it. This is how you get to know a person. And we don't do this enough with each other. First, you need to know their story. <coughs> do you take the time to sit down with an individual? Where are you from? Where were you born? Okay, brothers and sisters, we don't about mom and daddy's children. People like to talk about themselves. But we don't take the time to allow a person to talk about and tell their story. Some of those stories are good, some of them are tragic, some of them are painful, but it's their story. The other way that we get to know a person is to know what their dream is what they really would like to be, what they'd like to accomplish, what they have a passion for. What is it? We talked about that uh, Tuesday night, about your gift. You know, what is it? I know yours is opening up a, uh, what do you call that, box of 
lots of and that's a passion of yours and, and if you could do that tomorrow I'm sure you, you get that started and, and, and if your desire to do that that passion inside of you is part of, of your dream but also is probably is tied into your gifting in the body of Christ but do we take do we take enough time to listen to a person that what you dream about what would you like to really happen see I think sometimes that, that, that questions are more important than like Statements. Especially when it comes to a husband and wife, to be able to say, you know, wife said, what? What really? What do I do that really hurts you? What do I do that really makes you happy? And to give your wife permission to tell you those things, because it, it can make a difference. <laughs> if you gave them permission to ask you that question, because that gets on a level beyond you eat today, don't you? To this superficial stuff. Amen. But if you really want to get to know a person, start right there. Listen to their story, tell me the story, and then what is it that you really dream about? What do you want to do in life? I was down in uh, San Desmond, Florida this past week with my family and, and my little grandson. We were in this venue where uh, all the kids were in this theme park. And there was a guy dressed up like a pirate. And he was called Michael the Pirate. And he got up there and he told jokes and you know, and they played with these kids and they was all into that kind of stuff, you know. But anyway, my son went down after about 15 minutes and got his son in front and brought him back where he was sitting for whatever reason. So about that time, uh, Michael the Pirate, he reached down in his gold chest and throws all these coins out there to all the kids. My old grandson, Luke, he just started crying. It, you know, and my, my son felt like a, you know, we're, we're doing that. And uh, Luke was crying and he was sitting there. So they finished up. So when they got through, I was watching him over there swallowing and carrying on. The guy was packing his stuff up and getting ready to leave the platform. So I walked up there and I said, I said, that looked really good. I said, you know, you really, you really connect with these kids. That's a great job. I said, um, <clears throat> I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, oh, about 30 years. I said, really? And I said, well, what, what do you do during the week? He said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor over here. So and so church. I don't know. I so many things. I don't know. I mean, we talked for probably three minutes. Before it was over with, I, I knew so much about this guy. And I said, hey, my grandson's out here. I said, he missed being down here. And I said, uh, you got more coins? He said, uh, no. He said, something got to dig through his bag, you know. He said, I got a couple of higher flags. I said, well, come on down here. So we we'll keep walking up there, you know. I said, my pirate wants to give you something. So he gave him those little flags. And I said, can I get a picture of you too? They got there and said, he stood there, you know, and my next to the pirate, and I took his picture. You never saw such a, a beautiful smile on his face. But it took a couple of minutes to know about the pirate and to kind of help my grandson and my son to get over the whole thing. But getting to know each other is my point. It doesn't take but it doesn't take a, a minute for us to establish a relationship with people, people if we're interested in them. I always love it at, at the checkout stand when I see the clerk. But they got, I, there's a guy that runs the ice cream shop at uh, uh, what's the donut place? Dunkin' Donuts. So same one. I walked in and uh, I, I saw his name. It's the sound of girl's name. What was it? Vicky. Vicky. Name was Vicky. It was spelled different, but it still yeah. was Vicky. He said, I think he was. He said, they named me after my aunt. <laughs> well, anyway, he was dipping my ice cream, and the more I talked, the more ice cream he put in my cup. <laughs> 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 he but, huh? yeah. but uh, when, when we express an interest in a person and who they are, and of course, everybody wants to, wants to know them and know their name. You start building relationships. It might 
be a cop weld or a spider weld, but eventually you can pull a rope, you can pull a chain, you can pull a bridge. And it's like when we really show interest in who they are, right? and what's going on in their life, you really care. I'd like for us to for a scriptural place. Go to, let's go to Exodus. It's a story about Moses. And Moses is in trouble. Moses has got this, we're going to look at Exodus 34 and part of Exodus 33. Moses has got this big crowd of people. Some of say a couple million, some say four or five million people that he leaned across the desert. And he's concerned because about God and whether God is going to validate what they're doing, God's going to be with them. And I'd like for us to pick up in uh, chapter 33, verse 12, because Moses is wanting fellowship with God. He's wanting a deeper relationship with God. And how many of you know that when you start having difficulty and trouble, that's good if it draws you closer to God. My father-in-law said one time, he said, the devil just kept bothering him and kept harassing him and he just felt so pushed by the devil. And, and finally he turned around and just like he was talking to the devil, he said, devil, he said, he said, you can keep this up if you want to. He said, but all you're going to do is just push me closer. And that's what was happening in the life of Moses. He was being pushed in a, to a deeper relationship with God. He had gone from being a small town boy makes good coming out of Egypt to lead this great crowd of people, and he was the greatest. He was realizing he had a bunch of complainers, he had a bunch of murmurs, he had he had trouble on his hands. And so starting with verse 12, he said, Then Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Now, Moses realized, this is over my head. I can't handle this job. I can't handle all these people. I can't handle all the complaints and issues I'm having with it. God, this is bigger than me. This is your people. This is not my, this is your people. He said, I need help. Well, there's a couple of things that stand out. I'm going to jump from, from that chapter over to chapter 34 and verse 3. And God gives him direction on what he's supposed to do because he wants to draw closer to God. He's going to know God in a deeper way. And these are the two things that God says to him. He says, and no man shall come up with you and let no man be seen throughout all the mountains. Let neither flocks nor herds feed before that mountain. Now, two things I'd like to just draw out of this. That when you come before God, you're not bringing your mother-in-law with you. You're not bringing your children with you. You're not bringing... You've got to come on your own before God. It's just you and God. We'd like to think the crowds are going to come. You'd like to think, well, go with me because this... this you know, I, God says, no man is to be with you. That's right. You come... On your own, because the day that you die, it's going to be you and God. It's going to be you and the Lord Himself that you're going to face that day. So we start today. If you're going to build a relationship with someone, and you're going to, it's going to be a deeper relationship, you want it much deeper. It's you and them. He says, "Don't bring anybody with you. It's just me and you." The second thing that he says that he says, "Don't let any animals." Our flocks feed around this mountain. Now that says to me that there's something about the beast nature that's in us, the flesh that's in us, that will never know God. He said, don't let those animals come around. The flesh that we walk in, this realm of flesh that we cannot comprehend the God that we serve, it's going to have to be by the Spirit. He says, it's not by mind, it's not by power, but it's by my Spirit saith the Lord. It's a spiritual relationship. And this flesh of ours, we, you can read all the books you want to. You can talk to it. You can listen to all the sermons that you want to. But you will not know God in your flesh. You can have a, you can have a general intellectual knowledge of God, but it has to be a revelation. You were talking about sister. You said, God 
showed you that you wasn't going to save her. Even if you found her on the street, there was no guarantee that she was going to come back. It had to become a revelation to her that she needed God, and she was going to have to make that decision. I, you know, heaven, some folks ain't going to be happy in heaven. We're trying to get them there. Y'all come. But there are just some folks right now, they wouldn't be happy because their heart's not right. They haven't had a revelation of God and who God is and what a difference He can make in their life. So heaven would not appeal to a lot of them. They'd be standing on a bunch of hoot owls in a dead tree just watching everything else going on. They wouldn't be happy there. And here we are trying to get God to do that for us by His Spirit. He says, so don't let those animals come around. Don't let all that flesh come around and feed it the base of it. It's got to be by the Spirit. You come on up, leave all everybody else there. And that's that's where you, we have to get desperate before God. God, I am thirsty. I am hungry for God. You know, whether your wife comes, whether your children come, whether Amen. the rest of the church comes, we have to have a hunger and a thirst in our heart for God. Just us and God. Amen. So, he says, <clears throat> Moses is saying that, that he did not know him. Let's pick up Back again, let's go to, to verse uh, chapter 33 and pick up verse 16. For how then will it be known that your people I have found grace in, that I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we will be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. I'm going to stop right there and just take a rabbit trail for a minute. God wants us to be a separate and a holy Amen. He wants us to be a separate and a holy people. When I was a kid, I mean, if there was hair on your ear, that would be sin in your heart. <laughs> I, I mean, it was all about the way you dressed. It was all about the way you, you know, you didn't drink, you chew, and, you know, that, that was, it, it was just, uh, what was it, what is it that, uh, that Harry says, all you can do is eat so far and drink water? <laughs> but we are we are called to holiness. Does it bother you for somebody to say, hey, that's a man of God? That's a woman of God. You're simply the saints. There's some people out there that serve God, and when I get around them, I, I, I know that they that they are in, in touch with God. My, my mother was an intercessor died, Jesus appeared to her in the room before she died. And there's no doubt in my mind that she was telling me that God's truth that, that Jesus stood there and talked to her. And I came and I said, Mother, I said, what do you look like? You look like Jesus. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> and the Lord gave her two words. I said, what, what did he say to you? And she said, he said, uh, Get ready for the harvest. Get ready for the harvest. And said, get ready for the sudden. Get ready for the harvest and get ready for the sudden. There are things that are happening so fast. You have to turn your head and it's happening. And we're not prepared as believers. If we're not prepared as Christians. We can't, we're no different than any other person on the street out there if we are not prepared in heart for the suddenness that come to us. Come on, we can get a phone call one night. We can change your life for Something hit on religion happened in my, my out in front of my house one night, and I mean, it was bad. But there's one guy down the street that had a video camera. He picked it up on his on his garage. He saw me come running down the streets, and I met him. And he began to give direction. He pulled out a fire extinguisher. He began to do this. And he began to give orders and direction. I'm standing there, just kind of following what he was saying. But he had a protocol. He had served in the in the in the, in the, in the uh, Coast Guard. And he just put everything right in the place. If we as Christians, if we're not ready, maybe it hasn't happened to you yet. Maybe you everything's okay in your life. But every one of us are going to have that day when a cold wind blows through our house. And we have to deal with some, something we didn't expect. But having a prepared heart, you will be there. You will have that work. You will have your spirit built up. You will have that prayer reserved there to handle that situation if you're before God, if you're seeking God. So he says, God, 
so shall we be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are on the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please, show me your glory. Please, show me your glory. And if you follow that chapter on down, it says that God put him in the cleft of a rock or in a space and put his hand over him in some way. He passed by him. And when he passed by him, Moses saw something about the God of the Old Testament that totally unnerved him. Shook up his world, his whole vision of who God was. He saw the nature of God in a different way. So if you will jump <coughs> over with me to verse 6 of chapter 34. Verse 6 of chapter 34. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity. When we think about the God of the Old Testament, we think about the, the, the huge stone, we think about the Ten Commandments, we think about a God of justice, we think of God, of a God who, who he, he punishes the, the wicked. But all of a sudden, Moses sees a vision of the nature of God that, that he had not comprehended before. Do you realize how humble God is? Do you ever think about God being humble? That he puts up with you and I? way that he does. There's a humility about the Lord. There's a humility about God that shows us how we are to live our life and how we should live before Him. The humility of the Lord Himself. He has not destroyed this world already. But he has not already brought judgment more than He has to this country or everything that this country has represented in the past and where we are today. The humility of God. But he, talk, he, he began to see the, the mercy of God, the graciousness of God, the long-suffering, the abounding in goodness and truth. And so what does he do? What is the response of, of, of Moses to this? Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin by no means clearing the guilty. Jump down to verse 8. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. He said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and make us your inheritance. You know, when you come into the presence of God, not only does He you begin to reveal Himself to you, but you begin to see who you are. And if you are if you are not if you're not sobered by who you are and how we affect God and how we have lived our life. You really haven't had a real encounter with God. And there's some things in, in your worship services. We have these wonderful bands and groups that worship God. There's some things that worship can't overcome. If you've been living like the devil, you can come here and praise all you want to. But there's a time of repentance. There's a time of, of brokenness. Right now, this, this, this country is celebrating sin. They're happy about it. They got it in lights. How does the church respond to that? We should be on our faces, grieving, confessing our sins, having a broken spirit about all of this. Rather than sitting back and just kind of holding our mouth saying, I'm back to go into the Daniel, Nehemiah, and these other men of God, they said, oh God, we have sinned. They didn't say you have sinned. They have sinned. They said, we have sinned. It has to be personal. What's going on in this, in this country is all, it's all about us. If we've enjoyed the good, why not experience the bad that comes along with it? We have sinned, God. We have sinned. Forgive us, O oh God. Have mercy. So when he saw that, Moses says in verse 10, he said, Behold, I make a covenant. He wanted to enter into a, a deeper relationship with God. When he saw who God was, I'm not going up, he said, unless you go with me. He said, not only that, we need to be in a covenant. You know, this covenant that, that David and Jonathan entered into, sometimes people try to make that as a homosexual relationship. It was not. Those men were men of war. And they respected the, the talent and they respected the, the attitude that, that each of them carried in their hatred of evil and in their love for God. 
That's what brought them together. And it says that they stood before each other. And they made a covenant with each other. And they exchanged my armor for your armor. My sword for your, your sword. My helmet for your helmet. And they exchanged their weapons and entered into a covenant. And they said, throughout the years, if I get into trouble, I know you'll come before I am. If you get into trouble, you can count on me. I will be there. God has entered into a, a, a covenant with us through the cross. Anytime there's a true covenant, it's called a bereave, right? It, it involves blood. I don't know if they slashed their wrists or what happened if there was a blood exchange in any way, but circumcision represents the bereave that God has entered into his, with His holy people where men are circumcised. So that the heritage that comes through your loins is a holiness, dedication, to God for your hearing. When a man would swear to swear to another man, many times they would take their hand and place it on the inner thigh of another man and say, if you fail in this covenant or to keep your word, may your children be under a curse. That's just how serious the covenant was. And so uh, Moses would say, Let, let's just not talk about this. Let's, let's not just, uh, uh, this is not just a good idea to Let's enter into a cup. Let's enter into a, an agreement. That's what he was saying. Moses wanted a binding contract, a bereave, a cutting. And we can get off on that, and that could take some time. But I, I guess the next question I want to ask, is, ask us tonight is, what fellowship do you want with God? How much do you desire God? How much do you desire to be used by the Lord. Is it just name recognition? You ask someone, do you know God? Oh, I know God. Yeah. I, I, who is that God? Describe that God. They couldn't tell you. Well, you know, He's just the God of everybody. They can't tell you about His nature. They cannot tell you about His promises. They can't tell you about His commitment to each other. It's just God. A pantheistic uh, God who is in everything. That's not the God of the Bible. I know what people say about God. I come here to fellowship with believers and I hear people talk about God. But do you really know God? Do you have that? What do you say that, God? Uh, <coughs> yada. 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 Intimacy with the Lord. Close <laughs> relationship. He wants that intimacy with us. So God wants to know you too. And He know, he, this is how I know that. He knows your story. He already knows your story. Sometimes we think we got to tell God all about what's going on in our life as if He didn't get the latest information. <laughs> he knows our story. And even whenever, you know, you get on your GPS and you get off on the wrong road, somehow Siri or whoever still knows where you are even when you're lost. When you get away from God, He still knows where you are. He knows your story. So it doesn't take a lot of explaining to God. He knows your story. Luke 16, 15 says, you are, the, you are the one who justifies yourself in the eye of others, but God knows your heart. <coughs> what people value highly is detestable to God. God knows your heart tonight. I don't know your heart. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're planning. To, but God knows your heart. Now, he knows your story. Could be good, could be bad. It's sad. God knows your story. Nahum, the first chapter, the sixth verse, He knows those who take refuge in Him. I don't know who you're trusting in, but I'm not trusting in my Social Security. I'm not trusting in these other instruments and things for the future. God is my refuge. He is my refuge. A very present help in time of the peace. I know those who are taking refuge. In the John the 10th chapter 26 verse says, My sheep know my voice. God knows whether or not you're listening to His voice. Yeah. He knows. He's speaking. He knows those who are listening. Job the 23rd chapter in the 10th verse says, He knows the way that I take. Some of us don't know what tomorrow holds, but God does. It's 
2 Timothy, the second chapter says, He knows those who are His. God knows those who are His. God knows our story. So what fellowship do you want? He knows your story, but He also knows your dreams. He knows the aspirations of your heart. He knows where you want to go in life and what you want to do for Him. Luke 12, 7 says, The very hairs of your head are numbered. That problem with God. <laughs> Less and less of a problem for God. He knows the, the, the very number of the hairs on your head. Matthew 6 says that He knows what you have need of before you ask. Before you even make the request, God knows what you have need of in your life. So He knows your story, He knows your dreams. He knows us, but do you know Him? Matthew 7, 17 says that the time is coming whenever we're going to stand before God. He's going to make a declaration <clears throat> that's going to shock many people. He's going to say, depart from me. I never, <clears throat> I never knew you. Well, I just said God knows everything about you. No, we just didn't have a relationship <clears throat> together. Depart from me. I never knew you. <clears throat> had no relationship. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But you may be asking yourself tonight after what I've just said. God knows about me. God is aware of what's going on in my life. But how can God judge me? How is it that God can judge me in my life? But at the end of time, there was a throne room, a great throne Before that throne was a great plain. And on that plain, there were thousands of people. And they were all sitting, standing there, and they were looking at God. And God was getting ready to judge these people. <clears throat> and they said, how can God judge me? As I mentioned, the first had gone to the concentration camp, pulled up there to sleep and said, look at that tattoo. I, can get all my, I lost all of my family. I was the only one to escape. I was brutalized. How can God judge me? A horribly formed Arthur Riddick King. How, how can God judge me? Look at, look at my fingers and look at my legs. Look at my feet. How can He judge me? What does He know about this? Another person who had been an orphan, been put in one foster home after the other, been sexually abused. What does God know about me? He's going to judge me. He's going to tell me how I can live my life. <clears throat> so one after the other, these different ones start shaking their finger in the face of God. How can you judge? You don't know. God, you don't know what I've been through with this divorce. You don't know what I've been, how I've had to struggle financially, raise money. God, how do you? How can you do this? So they form a committee. And they got over to one side and they talked about it. And after they had met together, they came back and got in front of God and they said, God, in order for you to judge us, this is what you've got to do. They said, in order to know what we feel, what we've gone through physically, mentally, and emotionally, they said, you need to go to earth as a man. go to earth as a man and experience what we've experienced and the more they talk the more they realize that indeed that's what God has done God came to earth in Jesus to experience everything that you and I would ever go through even to the point when he was dying on the cross that Jesus said my God why have you forsaken me so that even the person who is a sinner cannot say, well, God, you don't know what it feels like. Well, Jesus, you don't know what it feels like to be separated from the God the Father. No, He does. He knows what a sinner's lostness feels. He knows what it means to be forsaken by His closest friends at the very hour of the cross that He needed them. He knows what it's like. He's, my father-in-law said one time he saw more backs than anybody. People who rejected what He had to say that He loved 
And even when they were taken to the cross, Jesus said, at least believe the miracles. Can you even believe just for the miracles? Jesus has experienced everything that you and I could experience. And the Bible says he is touched by every feeling of our infirmity. God has emotions. God has feelings. He can experience loss. He knows because of what Jesus is going for. God wants our fellowship. God wants to experience fellowship with us. The question is, do we want fellowship with God? Do we want to know Him beyond just His name? Do we want to know of His goodness? The Bible says the goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. Kindness leads us to repentance. He wants us to understand and to experience His nature. Moses said, God, I see all this. He said, but we're weak and we're sinful. It didn't bother God. That, that's, that's the interesting thing about God. Our sins don't bother Him. What really bothers Him is that He offers His goodness. And He offers His salvation. He offers His kindness that we still will not embrace it. We will not receive it. But it's ours tonight. I want to do something a little bit different. Ah, let's see. I need a mic to get white. Big feeling. Tanya. Ellen, you can help me too. What I'd what I like to do, I'd like to just, I'd like to know if I just need to come to your stand with me. And um, you, you may be here tonight, and I don't know what level you've been. <coughs> You may be touched tonight, or you, know, you may have a particular need tonight. But I'd like for these folks up here at, at the front to be available to you. If you'd like to go to the lady, go to a couple, please do, and something you want to share with them. And I'd like for us to just have a time where you can just pray together. Just, just, just share what's in your heart. You may have a financial need. You may not know Jesus if you're perfectly safe. You may be struggling with something, but I'd like to these just to be here with me and let's let's have let's have prayer again. Where, wherever you are, it takes it takes both to say, hey, I want a I want a relationship with God. I want fellowship with God. And uh, I want fellowship with, with these people right here. We're going to heaven together, okay? Yeah. Amen. We're, we're all going to heaven together. I'm gonna see you there. And uh we're gonna have a glorified body and the other thing will be as like we are we're good. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, I'm going to stand here. I'd like to sing a song. And you come here and help. You're not required. You're not required one time. Let's sing a song. Uh, those of you that would just like to just come up here and be with us and, 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 and let's pray together. You have know, silent prayer is okay, but you've got a mouth. Let's say something. Let's, let's pray and, and let's ask God uh, to help us in, in our situation.